So I would like to to welcome uh, to to present uh, my colleague my, Maria Bocharova, who co-organized this uh, this workshop. And my apologies that I haven't mentioned it in advance. Maria uh, is Ukrainian and English, if I may say that. So if there are any questions uh, in Ukrainian, you can uh, you may also want to ask in Ukrainian directly to uh, to Maria. But otherwise, Maria, over to you. And I hope you will have a lovely session. It will be about research landscape uh, trends with focus on Ukraine. But yeah. I have to I have to to leave you myself because I have some other commitment. So Thank goodbye. You, so and, there is. and apologies for the late yes. uh, <laughs> connection. With this. Goodbye. Bye bye. Um, hello. Thank you very much. Thank you, Agna. Thank you for introducing me. Um, so let me. Uh, I'll put my screen on as well. And just to mention, maybe at the start, I am going to be doing the presentation in English. So um, uh, my my Ukrainian. I do speak a little and understand Ukrainian, but my Ukrainian is not um, perfect. So please uh, bear with me if you do if you do want to um, ask something in Ukrainian. Uh, but I'll understand you. Just my answers might be um, a little bit tougher. But um, but I'm going to go through this in English, and then we can I can definitely engage later by email um, in in Ukrainian if that's helpful. So um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. Excellent. And I will mention we have 40 minutes, right, as already announced, and then 20 minutes for uh, answering questions. So yeah. first, over to you, Maria. Thank you. Yeah, so indeed, this is our housekeeping slide. So we have an hour for this session, 40 minutes presentation. Um, we're recording already. If you'd like to ask a question, well, we've done this bit already. So um, you'll uh, do as you've, uh, you as you've done so far. So um, let me introduce a little bit uh, myself in this session. So I am um, I work at Elsevier. I'm in the strategy team. So I'm not a publisher or editor directly, but I spend a lot of my time looking at what has been published and looking at some of the numbers and data behind what has been published and use that information to then think through as a company where we want to focus um, in terms of disciplines or fields of research, in terms of geographies, um, in terms of business models um, of publication. So I, I'll talk a little bit about open access. I'm sure you'll have come across open access models as well. Um, but a lot of this is rooted in some of the kind of trends and data that, that you see behind this. So I'll, I'll go through some of that. Um, so you can see I've got two sections. I'm going to start by talking about global research trends. So overall, what's happening in, in scientific publishing in terms of the numbers. And then I'm going to focus on Ukrainian research trends specifically and give a little bit of background as well um, for on um, various um, kind of opportunities for you to get information for collaborations and um, maybe a few um, helpful links um, that you may, you might you may find helpful towards the end of the session. So um, let me get going then on global research trends. So um, I don't know how much of this is kind of new and uh, and familiar or, or or not, but please do ask questions. So um, this the firstly what I'm showing here is the number of academic articles that have been published every year going back to 2018. Um, so you can see that that's been growing and there's every year it's been increasing um, at about 5% um, every every year. Um, and um, these are some numbers that are available publicly online. So we can you can see the source there at the bottom. Um, but you can see really also the difference that happened during the COVID year. So um, during COVID, um, what certainly we were finding was um, there were a lot more submissions coming in during that year, during 2020, which then were published during 21. So you can you can see that um, in the chart. Um, but the reason for that is many laboratories were closed. People weren't able to do research during 2020. So they focused a lot more on um, publishing what they already had. They had a bit more time to do that. And also there was more funding um, available for this kind of new subject 
um, around um, COVID, around infectious diseases. Um, so a lot more research was happening in that field um, and that, that happened kind of more throughout 21. So you can see this increase, which has then flattened out, but it's on average about a 5% um, rise year on year. Um, interesting um, kind of additional trend that we're seeing is that increasingly younger or earlier stage researchers are publishing more and more. So you can see here the um, not to five year researchers. These are people who are within five years of their first publication. Um, they are forming an increasing percentage of everything that's published. So going from 50 to about 60 percent. Um, a lot of um, these authors uh, are coming from newly emerging geographies. So, for example, China, which um, has grown a lot. I'll, I'll show that later as well. In recent years, they have a large proportion of younger or, or earlier stage researchers. Um, so that's an interesting trend to, to, to note. Um, and then this issue of business model. So I, I wanted to touch on this. Um, I, I don't know how much this is kind of clear and known, um, but open access journals um, and published articles are um, an increasing part of what is being published. Um, so open access, I'm sure you know this already, but um, open access are articles that are free to read um, as soon as they're published. And um, instead of being as we used to have subscription models, so in a subscription model, um, someone would subscribe and pay um, to, to read before it used to be a physical journal um, and now it, and increasingly online, but, uh, but it was a, a subscription to then receive that journal and be able to read it open access articles, the payment for public that covers the kind of publication process and the um, the processing of the article um, happens by the author, uh, but then it's free to read. So it's a slightly different model set up um, of how it works. Um, and there are different ways in which um, uh, these different types of journals where this open access articles can be published. Sometimes there are journals that are totally open access and they're, they're typically newer journals and everything in them is free to read. They are often online and easy to access. Um, but also historically journals that used to be subscription to subscribe, um, they also allow some open access publications as well, so that they're, they're a mix of the two. And that's why they're called hybrid or, or mixed journals, because they have both subscription articles and open access articles together. There's also, so that, that's the hybrid journal comment here. There's also something called a subsidized journal, which is they, they tend to be also classed as open access. Um, they're also called open access. Um, but the rather than the author paying, um, there's a subsidy. So often it's an organization like um, a, um, a university or sometimes a society um, pays a bulk amount. And then the people who uh, belong to that society or university or have membership then publish in that journal for free. So, and that's that's what's called subsidized because it's prepaid by, by a group. Um, it's also sometimes called Diamond OA um, is, is also referred to. Um, right. So, so this gives you a sense of um, the growth and you can see, you know, open access from something like 10 percent of the market or, or maybe 14 if we count subsidized has increased to a, a well over 30 now. And we expect this trend to keep going. Um, so we expect more and more um, articles to be published open access in the future. Um, we also, just to bring out this point about open access in hybrid journals, as we mentioned, um, about 5% of articles um, are also open access, but in hybrid journals. So this is this additional slice here. Um, and they sometimes come through in what's called a transformative agreement. So that's where um, a country or an institution enters an agreement with a publisher and they publish um uh, their, their authors are able to then publish open access. Okay, and here are um, here are some the the kind of a, a summary of some of the different business models. Um, 
by uh, by open access. So we mentioned already diamond, um, it's sometimes called platinum as well. Authors do not need to pay. Um, there's gold OA or fully open access. So all articles are published open access in that journal. Um, the journals are in the directory of open access um, and authors are required to pay um, a publishing charge. Um, there's something called green open access where um, your article is behind a paywall for some time, but then is opened later. Um, hybrid we've mentioned and then and also bronze open access, which is a bit less common, um, but there's a, a slight um, hesitancy or uh, it's unclear which um, license is applied. Um, open access is used uh, differently by different disciplines, by different subject areas. So life and health sciences tend to have more open access. Um, they uh, The reason for that is um, there are um, a lot of the work that's done here is um, directly applicable to real world applications, particularly in medicine. So having it open to read uh, for everyone um, makes it is a benefit for that for those communities. That's less the case in physical sciences, where um, uh, some the, the work doesn't always necessarily need to be shared. There's a lot of industry. Uh, there are a lot of industries that are that work in physical sciences, engineering and um, uh, etc. that don't necessarily need it to be open and um, social sciences as well. There's less around um, the kind of sharing aspect here um there's also a sense of in life sciences there are many many journals um so the space is quite fragmented so open access has been driven by um uh, not, not having or um being less um uh, tied to uh, having subscriptions to lots of individual journals we can also see open access changes by uh, geography and that's driven often by financial um, considerations about paying the article processing um, fee. So you can see Europe and China tend to have high proportions of open access published. Um, America has a bit less and India has even less. Um, so this includes all the open access models, but um, uh, often it's about kind of the, the paying the, the article processing charge that, that determines uh, the, the extent to which countries are uh, follow the open access model or are interested in it. Okay, so um, and I, I'm going to switch away from open access now and talk a little bit about discipline trends more generally. Um, so uh, this is what I have on this chart. Let me um, talk through it a little bit because it's quite a busy slide. Um, so what we have on the horizontal here is um, the growth rate of different disciplines. And you can see each of the circles on this um, page are a, a type of discipline. So medicine, engineering, neuroscience, they all have their own, their own area. So on the horizontal, it shows the growth between 2017 and 21 of those disciplines. Um, so you can see the high growth areas on the right here. Decision sciences, health professional professions, and environmental science. These are all globally growth areas in terms of research. Um, on the vertical axis here, we have what's called the field weighted citation index or FWCI. It's a measure of um, impact. So it's a measure of citations that those disciplines have. So you can see kind of higher up are disciplines that get more citations. Um, so um, you can uh, really, I think the point to notice here is um, that where the growth is coming from uh, globally. Um, and you can see medicine here is a big, big bu bucket here, but a, a reasonably high growth as well, about 10% growth then happening in medicine. And then let me touch on geography. So I, I mentioned earlier that China is an area um, where there is a lot of research. Um, it's now the largest country um, as of uh, last year, it's the largest country um, for 
research published across um, across all of uh, the whole world. Um, this just shows the top ten countries that are published that that and the amount of research that they publish. Again, this is a um, a public source, um, but you can see that it publishes a lot more than um, kind of almost uh, getting to twice as much as the US. Um, and certainly a lot more than European countries. And that's where the growth is coming from, from China. Um, uh, the global gro growth is coming from, from China. Okay. Um, and now I think what I'd like to do and spend a little bit more time um, on is Ukrainian research trends. I think maybe before we go on, are there any questions um, or is there anything that it would be good to to go into a bit more detail on in this in the bit piece that we've covered is everything clear from what i've said is there anything that it would be good to um maybe say a little bit more about i don't think there's anything in the q a is there no no okay okay cool oh michaela yeah Go ahead. Can you unmute? First of all, I would like to thank you about uh, your topic, and uh, it was very interesting. You sent and give, give, gave a lot of information, and yeah. uh, it was uh, real, really good information for all of us. Uh, I saw uh, what the way of uh, and business models also for our new journals uh, who would like to. Uh, work with Elsevier and uh, to prepare articles in this uh, I'm representative of uh, law mm -hmm. uh, way of uh, uh, science and it was an Sciences. And it's necessary to think uh, what kind of journals can be with Elsevier. Is it, uh, uh, for example, interdisciplinary research must be or uh, connected with uh, maybe economics, with, maybe with other sciences, or it must be uh, deeper, for example, uh, criminal law or criminology. And uh, it's also necessary to think to all of us, uh, is it necessary to connect some science uh, uh, in one journal or it's necessary to uh, have a narrow way of uh, creation of such uh, journals in future. So yeah. that's and, a uh, really about, good uh, question. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it, it's question if it is part not only my uh, thinking, but question yeah so i can i comment a little bit on that yeah so something that we have certainly been seeing is with um the increase in open access journals um there is also a tendency to have more broader scope journals um around and um, more a more broader scope. So particularly newer publishers that have launched, and th this isn't something that's necessarily kind of necessary. It's it's really a choice whether you which direction you go in. But a trend that we have seen is some of the newer publishers um, that have recently emerged, um, and some large ones among them are MDPI and Frontiers are big journals, big publishers. Um, their journals tend to be more um, broader scope. So they have indeed that there'll be kind of gen a gen general title that will include several dis different disciplines rather than having a narrow subdiscipline. And there's a lot of growth there. And there are a lot of there's a lot of content there. It's also something that we see that um, as fields develop and emerge, there tends to be more. Um, uh, more more of the newer research happens at the boundaries, at the crosses between disciplines. So at the indeed multidisciplinary um, areas. So um, because of that, that's 
that's typically kind of newer journals and newer areas of research will happen at the crossroads between different disciplines. So it's it's often kind of as you're thinking about growing and thinking about launching new journals, that's often a place where exciting new things happen. So it's worth um, it, it's worth thinking about that. Um, uh, certainly as you're as you're looking at new journals and developing and growing your journals. Yeah. Um, Yagna, go ahead. Uh, I just have a comment, if I may, yes. uh, in relation to this, and new journals will be covered as the next session, but maybe it's worth mentioning uh, in terms of overlap of different disciplines. Uh, it's a, really a choice of what you want to cover, but then you, our recommendation is to to uh, make the aims and scope really specific about this. Mm -hmm. So to be true to your aims and scope, to be true to your title that you choose, because typically titles cannot be changed after the journal is launched. And for example, once you get indexation, you, you lose all kinds of things if you start changing a title. So I think one of those things that we see a lot is, for example, submissions that are out of scope. So, but it's, 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 that's why I think aims and scope is really important, just to mention that. That's a fantastic point. Yes. Th thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. And indeed, um, that's something that often leads to um, manuscripts not being accepted. In a lot of cases, it's because the aims and scope are not followed. So it's very important to be very clear um, at the start about what your aims and scope are. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, why don't I go on a little bit and talk a little bit about how research trends are impacting Ukraine, re Ukrainian research specifically. And I'm looking at um, by um, a corresponding author um, coming from, from Ukraine. So you can see some of the some of the trends that have happened there. So let me go to the next page. So um, here you can see uh, it's this is a kind of mirror of the first slide that I showed. Um, so you can see the breakdown by different business models. Um, but this is of Ukrainian research. And you can see that um, really Ukrainian research has been growing from 2016 onwards a lot more quickly than gl the global rate. So um, we saw the 5% earlier and here it's 16%. So it's a lot, a lot more quickly. And then you can see what's happened in 2022. There were um, for uh, research has really been impacted um, by the full scale invasion. You can see the decline here is is quite large. Um, and obviously, there's still it's, it's still a continue continuing to grow. And I think if we look at 2023, the growth rate will increase again. But you can see the difference. And that's that's what happens when there's a really um, severe war in your country. It declines. Um, Another interesting thing for me was to notice that there are a lot of subsidized journals um, that uh, Ukrainian authors or researchers publish in. About 30% of everything published is in subsidized journals. So actually, in terms of open access, it's about 50% of everything um, coming from Ukrainian authors is open access, which is great. It means it's open to read. Um, there's a slight benefit in open access of um, citations. So when something is open, you're more likely to have people read it and more likely to be cited for, for an equivalent piece of research in um, open access and non-open access journals. So that's also uh, really good to see and really important to bear in mind. Okay, so um, moving on um this is also to demonstrate the importance of uh collaboration in research which um is kind of depending on what is published um different different amounts of citation or different different numbers of, uh, of citations are given to that research um depending on collaboration so you can see on the left here um about 10 percent of um, Ukrainian research 2018 to 23, big, big time range. Um, about 10% has only a single author. Um, about 26 is only within the same institution. And another 30% is only national collaborations, only work between different um, authors that are all in Ukraine, not necessarily in the same institution, 
but all in Ukraine. And then the remaining 30% is international collaboration. That's that's about how much um, Ukraine collaborates internationally. But actually, they make up two thirds of the citations um, that that are received. So there's a lot of benefit to international collaboration um, because I think you bring together different people, different ideas. Um, uh, it tends to the research tends to be more multidisciplinary as we've just as we've just mentioned and there are some statistics here about the citations per publication there's a, a, a much it's about nine on average for the international collaborated work um, and it's the same it's also reflected in this field weighted citation impact metric so it's, it's another metric um, of citation so something that's um definitely been positive is from um in the last year is despite everything and despite the the kind of horrific um circumstances of the war actually one thing that it's precipitated is far more international collaboration happening with ukrainian authors um because i think a lot of people have moved around that's that's my interpretation of these numbers and um researchers are more likely to work um, with with people wherever they're based. Um, so you can see about 45% of everything that's been published this year is actually part of an international collaboration. So that also um, kind of in, in really awful circumstances actually is brings some benefit to research, which I think is really a nice thing to, uh, to note um, that there are a lot more connections uh, um, and international connections being forged and hopefully will ultimately help to grow research in the future uh, as well. Um, so, okay, and let me then, then move on. And then um, where is Ukrainian research um, focused? So here are some um, slides that were um, wonderfully put together by Jeffrey, who's a colleague of mine, who's also on this call. Um, but uh, we cover a little bit where the focus is among um, Ukrainian research. So you can see a very, um, a, a lot of it is in um, social sciences um, around students. There's a, a little bit on um, education and um, Russian language, um, but I think it's a broad topic area that includes a, diff a, a lot of different areas um, that are around, uh, around students and education. Um, there's also a large number in um, a large amount of research in the physical sciences. So physics and astronomy in particular, um, medicine comes out quite high and then chemical engineering, material sciences and engineering also in the physical sciences. So you can see this is a color chart that shows um, by color um, where the big areas of research are. Um, chemical engineering, material sciences, you can see them here, uh, and engineering, um, and then social sciences is large here, and medicine is the, the kind of red section over there. Okay, and then um, what I want to show is some of the growth areas. So again, this is a, a chart that is similar to the one we looked at for global research, but now focusing on Ukraine articles published by Ukrainian authors in particular. Um, so by annual growth rate, you can see some of these where the disciplines are that are growing a lot. So decision sciences, um, arts and humanities, psychology, um, and also social sciences have a lot of growth as is medicine. So this, these are the kind of new, more newly emerging growth areas. But really, if you look at the more established, larger size um, circles on this um, uh, on this page, the big the big circles are mostly coming from physical sciences, and they're not growing as quickly. But they're a lot more established and a lot more, um, and their research that's prob probably kind of historically been happening for longer. Um, also, business management and accounting is a is a re is a reasonably large area within those. Um, and uh, this is uh, cutting down to a slightly more granular view. So it shows the same chart, but rather than these big areas, more of the topic areas 
where um, specific topic areas where research is happening. So decision making, um, fuzzy sets, um, for, uh, the, these are kind of quite specific terms around electric electricity, energy, economics. And again, you can see these areas uh, where there's really a mix of different disciplines where the growth um, where the growth rate is really high. So electricity, energy and economics, clearly it's at the joining, at the crossover point between um, energy and electricity studies and then how that impacts economics. Um, uh, computer crime, network security, intrusion detection, this is um, clearly an area to do with uh, kind of computation. And uh, again, there's a lot of growth here. Exercise athletes and muscle, muscle so um, algorithms, computer vision models, so so kind of areas, really technical areas as well, industry, innovation, entrepreneurship. So these are the large areas. Um, these are, by the way, to, to call out the way that these disciplines or topic areas are defined. And um, that's the way that we um, uh, we have we use um, this um, uh, sort of labeling system in a product called Cyval. Uh, which is um, which um, shares um, summary uh, um, statistics about areas of research, and this is a way that they classify specific um, uh, articles um, using the top keywords um, that are used in that article. So that's that's what I'm highlighting here, and this is um, it show it shows us some of the growth rates coming out. Um, okay, and let me move on. Um, and then um, we mentioned collaboration was a really top um, area. Um, actually, uh, th this this slide now shows where in which disciplines most collaboration happens. So you can see um, and, and also by country. So you can see these are the top um, six uh, countries uh, where collaboration ha is happening. Poland is there, Germany, America, UK, China and France. And collaboration, uh, typically uh, kind of physical sciences and astronomy is really the biggest by number of uh, manuscripts, uh, engineering, uh, material science, medicine, social science and chemical engineering. So these are the areas that were really the top, that we saw them as the top already um, in terms of where publications happen. And you can see Poland is really a big player and there's a lot of collaboration happening with Poland particularly in engineering, material sciences, it's the, it's the biggest, and physics, it's the, bit, the biggest columns there. Yeah. Um, and, then, uh, and then some of the other countries are also presenting growth areas. And then um, what I wanted to point out is this is, this is something that's um, maybe um, something that could be, uh, no, um, could be use, usable um, in future, but this is, where this is a comparison for these six countries of where they have large amounts of growth um, and large areas of research um, among the disciplines. And uh, so Poland and USA on this on this particular chart and how that compares to Ukraine. So what that's suggesting is that areas, depending on where um, your area of research is, you may wish to seek out collaborations and um, connections in um, the areas of research that are relevant to wherever it is that you are in this bubble. So um, potentially some of the opportunities are around medicine for both of these. There's a lot of work happening in medicine and slightly less relatively um, coming from Ukrainian authors. So um, collaborations in, in areas regarding medicine um, look like a strong opportunity. Um, Certainly around energy, environment and earth. And um, there's a lot of work happening in both of these geographies um, and possibly may present an area for, for collaboration. Um, and you can see that I've, I've we put a, a few kind of uh, specific areas here that could be of interest. Um, but also kind of computer science, a bit big area where um, it's worth um, connecting uh, with these countries. Um, and let me then show you similar slides for the remaining countries um, in that list. So also with um, Germany and UK. So again, um, big focus on um, on medicine and on um, in both of those. Also social sciences and um, environment and energy related research. 
Um, so there's there's space uh, certainly for connections to be formed there, um, particularly in uh, and in UK you can see also material sciences here, um, neuroscience, um, and then China and France. So you can see a very different pattern here for China in terms of where they publish. Um, there's a lot less in social sciences and a little bit less in medicine, but a big focus in maths and computer sciences, which again presents an area of, uh, of potential connection and collaboration um, with Ukraine and Ukrainian authors um, and uh, France, um, energy, environment, uh, medicine are particularly strong. And uh, this area around physics, this big, big purple area is um, is also an area of, of potential collaboration. Cool. So these are um, kind of specific, I guess, specific examples of where of where collaboration um, can be possible. Um, what I'm going to do then is move on to um, this is a slide that presents some um resources and you can if you can see this on this your screen you can use the qr code to find the link uh to um to the pages so science for ukraine is a website um where um you can find information about uh um about positions science positions and um kind of information and support there um also erc um, so you can use some of those. And here are some of the um, uh, the clusters around where that research is happening. So um, take take these and these are useful resources uh, perhaps to use. Um, there is also a, a second page that we have around Elsevier specific um, resources. So uh, I think Laura mentioned at the big, at the start that there are various that um, that we as Elsevier offer a number of different options uh, for Ukrainian uh, researchers. That includes access to Science Direct, Scopus and SciVal. I mentioned SciVal earlier around um, the different topics area, topic areas. So you can look at all of this specifically for your area of research um, on SciVal. And you can look at kind of the, the charts and the trends in your area and it um, to help understand um, maybe get a bit bit more idea of what's growing and what's not if that's if that's kind of the, the topic areas of that that are growing and that are um, that are growing less um, areas where you might want to launch new journals or develop new journals um, so these all of that can be accessed on um, Scopus and Cybel. Funding Institutional is a product that allows you to see where funding has been uh, exit in which areas of research there have been funding awards given the size of those funding awards and the number by discipline by country again so uh, obviously if there are funding if there's funding in an area that suggests that there will be more research going into being published in that area so from an editor perspective um it highlights some of the key areas that that are likely to be growing um, from a data perspective. So obviously the, the, there are kind of, the, you'll have information on this from the community perspective, but uh, but the data is available there. So you can find all the links to all of those here. Um, there are also free learning and depository platforms in so Mendeley and Researcher Academy um, are areas where you can listen to um, uh, uh, lectures and um, uh, guidance on kind of how to publish different different support for for publishing peer review for ed editors um, and uh, support and tutorials. Mendeley is um, a, a platform where you can um, connect with other researchers. Um, and so you, again, you can see the resources there um, and the links there. And then finally, APC waivers. So um, actually publishing um, Ukrainian affiliate, affiliated articles, open access, um, does not require uh, any payment um, because of the APC, um, uh, APC waivers. So again, that's a way of um, opening up your research, um, promoting it, making it, if it's open access, I think I mentioned earlier, it tends to, um, it may, may receive more citations relatively because more people access it. So um, the fact that it's absolutely free to do so is also something that, um, that we offer um, for Ukrainian authors at the moment. So um, you can see access to all of these resources again on this, you can use that 
that QR code. And there's a, a also a Clarivate Resource Center available here, so you can find some more information about them. Um, right, I think that's probably mostly the uh, um, everything I wanted to cover. Is there? It looks like there's one question. Um, so maybe before we go into questions, I will stop the recording. Yeah.